Hi, welcome back to Roark Knows Podcast. I'm uh, Rod Roark, I'm a board certified plastic surgeon in Dallas, Texas. And today we're gonna talk about faces, faceless adjuncts, all the things that are so hot today, you know, the deep plane, but also what do you do with a faceless? So, and I'm here with none other than Dr. David Hildago from New York City. David, welcome. Well, glad to be here, Rod. Yep. Good and to see you. David is a, is a world famous plastic surgeon. He's a clinical professor at Cornell, and he's an outstanding surgeon, teacher, and really well known in, in the entire world of plastic surgery for both breast ed as well as facial rejuvenation. So, so David, let's let's dive right in. So, uh, tell me about what type of facelift do you do, and and then we can talk about the adjuncts because today we want to talk about. What do people do with a facelift? Because we always talk about, I, I, I had a facelift, but most of the time you do way more than a facelift, correct? I do. And you know, there's a lot of confusion out there related to some of the jargon that people hear like deep plane lift or right. a ponytail lift. <laughs> Uh, yes. First first off, uh, as, as you know, facelift just treats from the upper cheek to the base of the neck. It doesn't do anything with the eyes and the forehead. So a facelift is basically a procedure that will tighten not just the skin, but the deeper layers as well. And as we know, the deeper layer called SMAS, S-M-A-S, uh, is instrumental for giving a beautiful result that lasts a long time. Right. So there are some nuances on SMAS types, and we can get into that if you wish. Yeah, and, and that's that's so correct. But but what are, what is the most common procedure you do with a facelift? In conjunction with it, as yes. a supplement or adjunct? Yes. Well, uh, eyes, uh, absolutely. Um, the eyes, you can't let them alone if there's a lot of aging in the lower face and you correct that, then all of a sudden patients will see their eyes don't match the picture. So eyes are done probably, I would say, 80% of the time that I do a facelift, most common adjunctive procedure for sure. Yep. No, I agree. And and when do you do a brow lift? Because they're not done as commonly as we used to, at least in Dallas. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, Rod, the brow lifts got a, a bad name because they were such a invasive procedure originally. And then, as you know, we trended away from that and tried to find easier ways to do it. So we have less invasive ways to do it today, but they don't last as long and they don't work. So as a result, I don't do brow lifts very often, but if you really need to do one, the traditional way still works the best. Right, no, I agree. And uh, and, and I agree that uh, the endoscopic minimally invasive really didn't work, it didn't, didn't give you the results you wanted. So eyelids are also my most common procedure. So, and then what type of facelift do you do? I mean, and what Dr. Heldago said was that there's so many confusion about, there's so much confusion about the deep plane. I mean, anytime you're manipulating the deep layers, the SMAS or below, you're in the deep layers. So it's not a new phenomena, but it's sure kind of wildfire on, on social media. So, I mean, I'm sure like, if, you know, like other excellent plastic surgeons, you vary it towards for the patient, right? You don't do, I just do this, right? Or yeah, hundred percent. I mean, you can't do the same technique for every patient, and that that applies to all the different procedures that we do. Right. So, in in terms of tightening that SMAS layer, there there's more than one way to do it, and I do it based on a patient's facial anatomy, their bone structure, their soft tissue configuration. Do they have heavy tissues? Do they have light tissues? What's their skin quality? All these things factor into what the best way is to tighten the deeper layers. Right, that's, that's well put. And and so when people say I'm doing a deep layer facelift, I mean, all of us do a deeper layer facelift because we're using the SMAS. I mean, m I mean, most plastic surgeons do some type of SMAS. It's a different type of SMAS, but I mean, I think there's been no study to show that one is significantly better than the other. The most important thing is safety, right? You agree? Exactly, exactly right. And uh, and as you know, it's it's more surgeon dependent. Some surgeons do a technique that is better for them and get equivalent results to using a different technique in another surgeon's case. Right, that's right. And it's all about safety and outcomes. And and I know recently you've been talking a lot about lip lifts in our national meeting. So tell us about when that is indicated, because again, that's another hot topic that probably is overdone. Don't you think sometimes? Yes, I would say, uh, Rod, currently it's sort of a fad. And uh, right. as plastic surgeons, we're still trying to figure out exactly the role of a lip lift, when to do it, when not to do it. The things I can tell you, though, is that it's not commonly needed. 
uh, as we age, the the lower, the upper lip rather gets longer between the nose. Mm -hmm. The lip itself gets thin. And so this procedure by removing a small piece of skin under the nose will make that distance shorter and will roll the lip out so that it looks fuller. Uh, the problem is it's it's easy to overdo that. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other things that influence when you might do that that you have to be very mindful of. So it's not like some of the more uh, tried and true adjuncts like chin implants and, and nasal tip plasties. It's, you got to be careful with that. Yeah. And I liked uh, what Dr. Hidalgo spoke at one of our recent me uh, national meetings. And, and I liked your approach. I mean, you do it selectively and you, you're very conservative because if you overdo it, you can't go back. And it's a, it's a real problem. A hundred percent. I mean, an overdone lip lift, it just doesn't look right. And, and there is no way to correct it. Yeah. So you want to be extremely conservative. Okay. So what other uh, adjuncts do you do or recommend in your patients? So you're doing a, a, a smash facelift and you're doing other things in the eyes. So what are the other common things that you do that pe people should know about and ask for? Well, Rod, you know, most patients complain about their neck, and that's what brings them in. And then second to that is the jowl area here where they start right. to see some laxity. So they focus on that. And and what they don't really see as clearly is the middle of the face, which the facelift does not treat. The facelift treats the cheeks, the neck, but nothing in the center. And there are a number of things that we can do in the center of the face to enhance the results of a facelift. Uh, for me, the, the most common one is a chin implant, and most patients are kind of surprised when I recommend that, but they don't see themselves from the side. And a chin implant, it, the purpose is not to make the chin bigger or stick out more. It's to actually give establish a corner so that from the side, there's more of a corner and it doesn't just drop like that. And it, they're so subtle that right. most friends, family members, they don't even know it's been done. So chin implants uh, are probably the most common followed by resurfacing of the upper lip because many patients will get those fine lines mm -hmm. of the upper lip between the nose and the lip. And, and you have to do something about that to get a nice result. Sure. And there are several ways to do that. Yeah. Well, let's talk a little bit about the chin implant. I agree. It's done with a little incision, you know, in the submental area. I, I, I assume you do it there, not in the intraoral, right? Right. hundred yeah. percent. Yeah. And uh, it's almost in, in, um, you can't hardly see it. And I, I agree with you. I think it's subtle. The key is to do a small implant most of the time and to shape it. And, it, and most of the time, a well done chin implant, you, when you see the patient back, you don't even remember it until you look at the op note, right? You say, wow, it looks right. good. Right. So it's, it's a great thing to do. And they last a long time. They have a long, long period. I mean, it's not like a breast implant. I mean, I, I, I've had patients that have had their implants for 30 years. You, you as well, probably. No kidding. And uh, and they don't have complications. I mean, yes, you can have a problem with anything, but chin implants, I can't remember the last time I had an issue with it either being crooked or infection or any of that. They're very reliable, very easy to do, very subtle. And it's it's a real finesse move that can enhance the results significantly. Yep. No, I agree. So let's, let's shift to skin resurfacing. Obviously, you know, that's a very powerful technique, and I do it very commonly as well, peels or lasers. How do you decide what to do, and and do you do the whole face or mainly the perioral area? What do you... Well, you can do it either way. I focus more on regional resurfacing at the time of the facelift because, after all, you're lifting the skin on the cheeks. And it, to me, it, it doesn't make a lot of sense to also essentially burn the skin on the outside at the same time. So uh, what I focus on is the, the lip that I already mentioned. Uh, the lower eyelid commonly has very fine mm -hmm. uh, wrinkles or ridids as we call them. And uh, either a chemical peel or a CO2 laser, uh, those things can be safely done at the same time as a facelift and you're hitting the biggest areas of concern. If a patient has skin that you know is, is modeled uh, a lot of uh, you know sun damage, then I, typically recommend that they come back and do like a full face fraxel or laser separately from the facelift. Mm -hmm. So what what do you when do you do a laser when do you do a chemical peel you know a regional one around the perioral area what, what is Well uh, you know we, uh, we can accomplish the same goal with whether it's you know chemical uh, uh, mechanical dermabrasion or heat energy with laser it's just what you're comfortable with. Mm -hmm. I like dermabrasion, which is just right. a mechanical tool that spins around. 
and it's like sandpaper and it's, right. it's, it's, it's for me it's more like an artist's tool and I can just shave it down exactly to the level that I want and go no further so I like to control and that's why I use that traditional method yeah no I I've used derma abrasion I use I use a chemical peel for lighter wrinkles and then deeper ones I use a laser but you, I agree I mean it's all about what you're hearing uh, Dr. Hidalgo talk about is safety you know safety in the hands of an expert and I think that's the most important thing and sometimes especially in social media, that's kind of, you know, a byline. And, uh, you know, you got to, you know, the most important person in your outcome is your surgeon, in, especially in facial rejuvenation. So I can't overemphasize that. So what other, what, what about facial fat grafting? I, I do a lot of fat grafting. Uh, uh, tell me, do you do fat grafting or when and why or... I, I do, Rod, and, and uh, I've gone through sort of an evolution in fat grafting. As you know, it's so popular now in our specialty, uh, and it's used for everything. Uh, but I think the face is, uh, is, is unique in several ways. First of all, the face moves a lot. And in my experience, when you put fat into the cheeks, for example, or around the mouth, center third of the face, there's a lot of movement just in the normal course of the day and i don't think the fat grafts take very well in those sure. situations the two uh, specific examples where i think it works really well is when you put it down deep on the bone like for cheek highlights and the right. malar bones as they're called right here i think it works very well for that very predictable uh, i also think in some of our patients you know in the older patients over 65 you know the cheeks are getting really thin because they've lost all their facial fat uh, I think it's great for the cheeks themselves here, but not at the time of the facelift, obviously, because you can't put fat grafts in and have them stay where you want. So I come back later and do that. And and those two areas, the cheeks uh, and the, the malar bones here, I think work really well as far as fat grafts in my hands. Yep. No, I agree. I I do facial fat grafting with most of my faces as well. And I do. I love the deep mailer and in the cheek area. I agree with you. And sometimes I put it in the temples, too, because that's kind of an early signs of aging. And that, that works great. So so what what is your typical uh, post-op recovery for a facelift that you've just talked about with? And then tell me when you add an adjunct. I mean, obviously, when you add a dermabrasion or a laser, you add some time. So, so what is it? You know, obviously, you're in New York. People want to get back to work. I mean, what is? What do you tell your patients? I tell my patients two weeks. They're going to look very presentable, but not perfect. And what extends that by a week is the resurfacing that we're talking about, like dermabrasion or laser. That takes longer. the The actual surgical part heals very quickly and the bruising is tends to be minimal uh, there's a little bit of swelling it's mostly under the neck under here but by two weeks patients look pretty good yeah no i agree and sometimes when i do fat grafting they tend to bruise a little bit more especially around the eyes so so i and you, we talked a little bit earlier about now uh, rhinoplasty i mean i do a significant amount of rhinoplasty with a facelift i mean and i've seen you do it as well and show it on face and on on instagram as well so so when do you think about doing a rhinoplasty or a tip plasty with them? Most patients, as they get into the older age group, the, the nasal tip grows, the cartilages grow. And when they grow, the tip gets more bulbous and it tends to droop. Those are ideal candidates for just addressing those specific issues during a facelift because very effective. That's the area that needs to be improved doesn't add a lot of time to facelift procedures, which as you know, can, can many, many hours doing many different things. So you kind of have to budget your time and do what's effective. So in, in my practice, it's, it's rarely the older patient who wants a complete rhinoplasty. It's usually, you know, the tip just doesn't look right. It doesn't go with the picture. It's a little too okay. uh, obvious. Those are the best candidates for doing a, an adjunctive procedure like that, which doesn't add a lot of operating time. Yep. No, I agree. And, you know, less is more in the aging nose and, you know, bringing the tip up, sometimes taking a little bit of a bump down, you know, just to make it, you know, look like the, their rejuvenated face. Yeah, I like that. So, so David, tell us, you know, some take home points for the viewer when they're selecting a board certified plastic surgeon to do their face and, and just some points that they should consider, uh, especially when they're looking at adjuncts as well for uh, facial rejuvenation. I think the first thing I would say is, you know, many, many patients say, you know, am, do I need a facelift? Am I ready? And, and I, what I would say is 
when you start seeing a lot going on in the neck that catches your eye every day when you're, you get out of the shower, putting on your makeup, whatever, <laughs> you know, you might be getting into the territory for a facelift. So that's those are the initial signs that might bring up, bring the question uh, up. As far as selecting a surgeon, I agree 100 percent. You want somebody who's board certified. Um, you want to go through their reviews. You know, reviews aren't perfect, but if you if you go through them, you're going to get a sense of the surgeon and, and their practice. Um, you don't want to just pick somebody who's, a, you know, a superstar on Instagram. That's otherwise, you right. know, your, as your sole criteria. And it's helpful if you have friends who have gone to this person. So, you know, you get a, a more input that way. Um, I would also say, as I said earlier, you know, don't pay attention to the marketing labels that, that are kind of jargon like deep plane lift or ponytail lift. You know, just don't pay any attention to that. Uh, when you go see your surgeon, listen to other suggestions they have. You're focused on the neck and the jowls, but they're going to they want the whole picture to look good. So so take into consideration what they uh, suggest to you. And, and finally, leave yourself some time to heal. Don't try to jam this into the busy schedules that we all have. Just make a window at least three weeks. If you've got a, a big, high-profile event, keep yourself six weeks at least. I agree. Just so everything looks perfect when the time comes. Yep. Wise words from a wise surgeon in New York City, Dr. David Hildago. It's always a pleasure to have you with us on our podcast. And, and we're going to uh, show you your website and also uh, how to contact you. David, it's, it's amazing. I, I love what you do, and I do so much of what, what you do. And uh, I can't tell you much how much I appreciate you coming on to Roy Knows Podcast. Thanks, Ron. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. We always talk about some interesting things. Thanks so right. much. Thank you.